Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the mailbox for the 8th of September 2011. My name is Total Biscuit, bringing you your daily dose of community interaction, gaming discussion, and all that good stuff. You can email in mailbox at cynicalbrit.com. That is mailbox at cynicalbrit.com with topics for future shows. The game in the background is Rock of Ages. Such a good game. Continues to be really, really good. I've got to play some multiplayer of this. It does seem like it'd be a lot of fun in multiplayer, but... Yeah, not regretting picking this one up, especially not for $10. First email comes in from Marco that says, I've been following your channel for nearly a year now, with WTF is being one of my favourites. While looking at the games presented there, it seems like a lot of indie titles go for a sort of goofy, funny worlds and story type affair. Why do you think a lot of indies go towards these light-hearted, funny games? Or have I got things wrong and there are also a lot of serious games out there? Well, there are quite a few serious games out there, but... When it comes down to being lighthearted and funny and things like that, it's a good way to go if you want to try and sell a game when you don't have, say, good graphical fidelity available to you. When you create a game on an indie budget with an indie-sized team, then you've got to be thinking, well, how exactly am I going to sell this? Because you can't just release a game out of nowhere. You can't do it. You have to market it best way to market it is to get attention and it usually comes down to word of mouth really i think word of mouth is perhaps the strongest thing that indies have going for them they can't really afford proper marketing they can do stuff like try and get an episode of wtf is done about their game a lot of indie devs do that these days they contact me with review code and say can you have a look at the game and if i've got the time i will do it and there are some games that i've missed out simply due to lack of time and i would like to have nailed those down as well but it's just times when you can't. It's as simple as that. There's too many games, or maybe the game is just so ridiculous that I just couldn't give a first impressions on it. Like long RPGs are really hard to give a first impressions of. Grand strategy, I just I can't play grand strategy to save my life. Really, really hard to get into big learning curves and things like that. Aside from that, yeah, you can do that. But anyway, that's beside the point. One of the ways of marketing your game is to have something kind of crazy and attractive about it. For instance, Rock of Ages. You have a look at Rock of Ages and the trailers and stuff they released. The graphic style is wacky. It's very Monty Python-esque. It's very unique. The whole idea behind the game is crazy and unique and it attracted pre-release attention as a direct result of that. If you took the concept of Rock of Ages and made it uber serious, you wouldn't get anywhere near as much attention, which is why you tend to get these more light-hearted games that happen to be indie. Also, it kind of matches up with the price tag of a lot of indie games as well. The idea of cheap and cheerful is a very powerful idea when it comes to convincing somebody to buy it because if people are okay with just throwing a small amount of money away on what they consider to be a bit of a throwaway title, it's like, this is cheap and cheerful, maybe I'll get a couple of hours of fun out of it and that'll be that and I don't really mind otherwise, then you've got yourself a sale there. Whereas if you make it a bit more serious and you make out like it's going to be kind of an important purchase, I guess, then that can be a problem for some people. Some people just don't want to do that. They would perhaps think more about it and as a direct result they don't end up buying it in the long term. It's a bit of a problem. Marketing is all down to perception really and what you want is for people to perceive your game as something cool and funny and unique that they're going to get a few laughs out of and at the end of the day games are supposed to be fun so that's one way of trying to convince your potential audience that your game is fun by like creating a wacky world or something that appears to be funny something that you can put a really good trailer out of and some preview assets and people laugh at it and then they say oh i want to see what else this game has to offer Humor is an important part of a lot of games, and you can compensate for lack of fidelity in other areas by having a humor. For instance, no time to explain. Not a game that I enjoyed a huge amount. Doesn't mean that it's bad, it's just not my cup of tea. But I wanted to keep playing because it was funny, and I wanted to see what would happen next, and what other crazy phrases the future me had. And that helps. It does shore up the game and compensates for other potential weaknesses within it. If the game is funny, you are willing to overlook certain aspects. If it's not funny, chances are you'll be a little bit more critical. 
Hey TB, first wanted to say I love your channel and all the great content you put out on it. Now, on to my question. I was browsing Reddit like I do from time to time and I came across an article on Kotaku. Oh, that's not a good thing. And it was talking about PC gaming, the truth of PC gaming. What they considered to be the truth about PC gaming really surprised me. And honestly, it was a little insulting. Lilith to say I didn't agree with Kotaku's post, but I was wondering about your opinion. Have they gone mad? Do they have a genie telling them the future? Are they just trolling? Well, what Kotaku are doing, as they have a tendency to do, along with pretty much every other site that's part of the Gorka Media Group, is a practice called nerd baiting, And it's a really, really good way to bring in lots and lots of traffic, delicious traffic, that also gives them ad revenue. So, what they tend to do is to put out these inflammatory articles and cover it up by saying, Guys, we're just a blog. We're just a blog. You can't get serious about this. It's just this guy's opinion, man. Now, this guy in particular goes by the name of Joel Johnson, and he also wrote an absolutely stupid article on the subject of the Razer Blade, if you remember correctly, that extremely expensive-looking gaming laptop that Razer are putting out. The title of that article, by the way, was The Razer Blade Might Not Just Be the Future of PC Gaming, It May Be the Future of PCs. <laughs> what? And here's the problem. That article got 160,000 views. That article was so incredibly stupid that people flock to it in order to leave their comments and laugh at it. And you know what? Joel Johnson was laughing all the way to the bank because it's not about journalistic integrity with the Gorka Group. It never has been. Kotaku has not been about that for a very, very long time indeed. They have very few qualified writers. Their opinions are generally misinformed. They create sensationalist articles. They are a blog. Don't mistake it for a legitimate news source. Kotaku is a blog. They are a very sensationalist blog. They are effectively the TMZ of gaming, for instance. Make no mistake, they want you to get mad. They want your traffic. Why do you think I'm not linking to this article? Don't give it to them. They do this to get attention. It's as simple as that. There is no other purpose behind it. Joel Johnson is no doubt getting paid on a CPM basis, which means the more traffic he generates, the more cash he is getting in hand. And he will write more of this nonsense. Nerd baiting is a very effective way of making money at the moment. Because if it gets traction on YouTube, a big forum, Reddit, Slashdot, then it will bring in an awful lot of traffic. And smartly, some people have taken to taking the article and putting it on a site like, say, Pastebin, so that you can read the article and not have to give Kotaku traffic and give them the impression that writing nonsense like this is actually a good way of generating more hits. At the moment, it is. And therein lies the problem. Let me give you some choice quotes from this article. There are two types of PC gamer, apparently. So you can break them purely down into two types. That's always a good start to an article, making sure that you broad stroke millions upon millions of people. And the second type, he describes, Then there are gamers who like the PC because they mistake tinkering with hardware from a couple of dozen vendors, all of whom get their silicon from three giant corporations or some sort of engineering, despite that it's more or less electric Lego for masochists. These tinkerers are holding back PC gaming hardware, and that includes the very benchmark by which they gave themselves, graphics performance. Now, he goes on to fail to justify that opinion in any way, shape, or form, going on to say that, well, basically nobody builds PCs these days, which of course is simply not the case, going on to get extremely defensive, for instance, about the fact that people didn't like his article on the Razor Blade, and calling those who disliked it overly defensive and short-sighted members of the PC gaming community. Now, if you recall his previous article, he believed that the Razer Blade was somehow some kind of standardization of gaming platforms for the PC, and that this was a great way of going forward. Ignoring the fact, of course, that gaming laptops have been around for quite some time. I personally own one. It's really quite nice. It's about half the price of a Razer Blade. It's called an Asus G73, and I don't have any problems gaming on that machine. Assuming that I wanted to game on a laptop, I could buy a PC that had that kind of performance for about half the price, I might add from any number of vendors, or I could buy the parts and put it together myself, or I could buy the parts and give them to someone who did know how to put it together themselves and pay them a small fee in order to do it, which is not all that difficult. You simply need to walk into an independently owned computer store in this country, of which there are very many. The Razer Blade is not the solution. It is not the messiah. It is not a standardization of the PC platform. It is an expensive gaming laptop with some gaming specific features that up the price quite significantly and don't really provide anything groundbreaking in terms of usability. 
Ooh, we can have a keyboard that changes around, or alternatively, you know, you could use a normal keyboard, which is just as effective. But, but it, it, there's pictures. I don't want to look at pictures, I'm looking at my screen. What about that little panel down there? If I'm looking at my keyboard, I'm not looking at my screen. Ergo, I'm probably getting shot. This is not a very good thing, all things considered. The amusing thing that he seems to ignore entirely is the fact that, yes, actually, the hardcore tinkerers are the guys that are driving the platform's hardware forward because not all that many people are buying the high-end stuff, and I'm talking about the really high-end stuff. Those are the people that are pushing the hardware providers to actually provide higher-end kit. If that were not the case and everyone was hanging around the mid-range all the time, then the technology in general would not accelerate, not go as fast as it should, and therein lies a problem with it. Yes, hardcore gamers and hardcore tinkerers do purchase an awful lot of titles. They build these machines specifically so that they can buy the latest and greatest and run it at high fidelity. Those are the kind of guys that are day one early adopters of games, and they are, for the most part, being the guys who are contributing to those day one and first week sales figures that are actually green lighting sequels and things like that. Yes, the guys on mid-range machines contribute as well, there's no real doubt, but it is safe to say that hardcore gamers with hardcore machines tend to buy the latest and greatest more. Thankfully, PC gaming is so ridiculously scalable now that even if you're on a low-end machine, you can still play some of the latest games. Yeah, you're behind the curve, and there really is nothing wrong with being behind the curve, I might add, because even being behind the curve on today's modern PC market puts you ahead of consoles in terms of capability. But really, the article is asinine nerd baiting. There is nothing remotely useful about it whatsoever. There's this message in there that's like, oh, we should have standardization. No, standardization is not what is weakening the PC platform. You cannot standardize the PC. It cannot be done. You want to know why? Because people buy PCs for a host of different reasons, and yet people buy consoles usually for one thing. A console is under a television. It is there to provide entertainment. Mostly gaming, sometimes Blu-ray, but mostly gaming. PC is bought for a hundred, a thousand different reasons. And people are okay with having a low-end PC if all they're going to do is use it as a word processor. Standardization isn't going to help at all. I'm going to turn around and tell those people, well, we've standardized now, so you're going to have to pay, what, 600 to 1,000 pounds for a new machine that is the standard? No, that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. The article is based on fallacy. PC gaming tech-wise is held back because the majority of development resources are dedicated to the platforms that will sell the most copies. That would of course be consoles. That is probably not going to change. And you know what, that's alright. Because consoles are a good way of playing games. They're nice and simple, they are generally not particularly expensive, they are easy to use. PCs will never be that. Never. It's not gonna happen. You can't justify it most of the time. Bear in mind that this is the guy that was singing the praises of the Razer Blade, which is a $2,600 laptop. That's his idea of standardization. Right. Okay. So, this is going to move people away from consoles. Is it something that costs the price of... Let's see, let me just do a little bit of math in my head here. So, $2,600, current exchange rate would be about £1,700. I can buy 17 Xbox 360s for that. That's a lot of Xbox 360s. Alternatively, I could buy an Xbox 360, a PlayStation 3, a Nintendo Wii, all of the peripherals I want, some games, and an expensive large screen television for that price. And you're suggesting that I should instead buy an expensive gimmicky gaming laptop. Right. Okay, that is your form of standardization, is it? Hmm. You know what would be nice if we could standardize gaming press? That would involve having standards. Kotaku doesn't have those things. Perhaps they should look into them. Now, let's be fair to the guy. His argument really wasn't centered around the Razer Blade being amazing, regardless of the fact that Kotaku has repeatedly hyped Razer's Switchblade and the Blade to ludicrous degrees, which does make me question, I have to say, their neutrality on the particular matter. The point, however, is it is the most anti-capitalistic sentiment I could possibly imagine, the idea of removing competition. Now, his argument goes in to say that, oh, well, there isn't any competition anyway. Technology has been driven forward by three companies. Yes, that is absolutely true. But there are also many other companies who are creating, for instance, laptops. If he's going to focus on the Blade, then let's talk about laptops, shall we? There are a ton of companies producing gaming laptops, whether they be custom-built or whether they be bespoke. And bespoke 
spoke are perhaps the most popular in that regard, and it is about choice. And as a direct result, you have these guys attempting to one-up each other, which gives lower prices in general for everybody, and it encourages faster development of technology. And these are the things that you don't really have with Apple, for instance, because Apple is in and of itself a monopoly when it comes to Mac OS. You buy an Apple machine, you buy whatever Apple believes is appropriate at the time, you can upgrade it, but you will pay an awful lot of money for it. And here's the thing, you simply cannot compare PCs to consoles. You can't, you cannot do it. They are not the same thing. Why would you want to standardize PC gaming? If you want to standardize PC gaming, go back to consoles. If you want a standard format, go back to consoles. That is what consoles are. How do you standardize a PC? It's a fanciful idea, it's absurd. It involves monopolizing the whole thing. It involves turning PCs into what Mac is right now. And do you really want that? I wouldn't. Macs are incredibly expensive. There's no doubt about that. They are a premium product in comparison to PCs, regardless of the fact that PCs are always, always cheaper. You have to look at a couple of things. You don't want to be dumbing down this argument to the level that this guy has when it comes down to PC development. Why are games not made in greater numbers for PC? Because they don't sell as much as on consoles. Will they ever sell as many as on consoles? No, never. Never. It's not going to happen. Because you know what? Consoles are just easier, they're cheaper, they're more convenient, they will always be so. Always. This does not mean that PC gaming is dead or dying or any of the above. They can sell enough to make it justifiable. That's the point. And there are increasing numbers of PC games coming out. There are more coming out. There's no doubt about this. There is no slowdown in development. There are huge numbers coming out thanks to digital distribution. And you know what? Digital distribution made things very, very easy. It handled all of the installation, as you could say for Steam, for instance. Regardless of my problems with it, it handles all the installation. It makes things very, very simple. It keeps the game up to date. Patching is now thrown out of the window. It keeps DirectX up to date. That's also a big deal. And it can even update your graphics card for you. So that is the standardization that we need to be seeing. Not in terms of the hardware. Hardware standardization is damn well irrelevant. The vast majority of games these days will run on hardware that is two to three to maybe even four to five years old, and most of them will also auto configure for that hardware. You do not need to tinker to get things running. Sure, there are problems, but you are never gonna be able to eliminate those. You can't turn a PC into a console not without wholesale annihilating a large number of companies. How do you do that? You don't, because that is really anti-capitalistic. Competition is what breeds innovation. Competition breeds, hopefully, consumer-friendly practices. More to the point, a better deal for consumers in general. Monopolization breeds a bad deal for consumers in general. See Apple. Here's a simple fact, the number of PC ports is growing, it is not going down. There are less and less exclusives. More and more games are coming to PC because it's easier to develop. You want to know what I expect? I expect consoles to move closer to PCs, not PCs move closer to consoles. I expect development to be set up in such a way that it is easier to port. I expect engines to be created in such a way that they are easy to apply cross-platform. PC development does not have to be the primary platform for absolutely everything. PC does not have to be the primary platform for every game. What has to happen, however, is for ports to come out that are actually solid and work properly on PC, and it involves taking into account the unique nature of PCs. That's a development mistake. That's got nothing to do with hardware whatsoever. Nothing at all, and I think that is perhaps the biggest fallacy of these articles in general, is that this guy is mistaking this problem for being an end-user issue. Well, people don't want to buy things on PC because PCs are too complicated. No. It's not that PCs are too complicated, it's that consoles are simply more convenient, they will always be more convenient, and there is nothing you can do about that. Okay, folks, that is me done for the day. Thank you very much for watching The Mailbox, and I will see you next time.